going to be talking about Zero Trust Explained, so I'm going to kind of be demystifying all of the different acronyms and the words, the products that are out in the market today, um, and then if you are interested in what Juniper is doing in that space, you have a lot of people here that can help you with that. like to kind of talk through and level set with organizations is kind of what the journey looks like with Zero Trust because when I do consulting and I do events and forums and I talk to people, there's one of two paths they're going through. Either the organization has set a board level strategy or non-technical stakeholders have set a strategy and the organization's then kind of made a high level statement about Zero Trust and the rest of the teams are going to spend the next 18 to 36 months figuring out what those projects and those products are going to be. So that's kind of like the high level plan. About half of the organizations, though, were jumping in and saying, we're going to go ahead and just solve some point problems with some point projects that are going to get us towards zero trust, but not as in a structured way uh, as some of our peers might be doing. And so those are the two paths into zero trust. Um, but regardless of, of which way you're doing, when you get to the position of making those decisions about what you're going to do, and then you eventually get into solutioning for it, um, it looks a little bit like this. But I'm not going to walk you guys through all of this. We're going to. This is a discussion. It's a short session, um, but it is. It is important. You know, we do always talk about starting with visibility. I think what's different with zero trust is we're not just talking about asset visibility. We're talking about the visibility and data and classification of data. We're also talking about visibility on a much more granular granular level of privileges um, and accounts, non-person entities, API keys. So the world of visibility for zero trust and how those things interoperate is much broader than what we've had for visibility just for compliance in the years past. So I'm not going to dive too much into that. Uh, that's your nickel tour there. The next thing is doing an assessment and I think one of the questions organizations have or professionals have is what does zero trust even mean? So I am going to walk you guys through a little bit later uh, a little bit of this assessment gap analysis solutioning to give you some examples of, okay, I'm sitting here and I'm supposed to do zero trust, what does that mean? How do I start? How do I actually, what's a template for me to put on a piece of paper and figure out what I need to do and then prioritize that work? Um, and then we'll talk about tracking progress. And again, I'm not going to dive too much into that part. Um, there's two methods for tracking progress. Um, one is more structured with the formalized maturity model. Um, and one is a little more ad hoc where we're assigning a risk-based value to the work we're doing down here. So... The use cases for Zero Trust are obviously myriad. The ones that I'm still seeing a lot right now are these. Um, so VPN replacement, things like privileged access management, possibly for your internal teams. And again, this stuff can be on-prem or in the cloud. And then we get into things like third-party access and DYOD, where we have some type of privileged access for non-managed endpoints. Um, access to controlled data, then that is kind of one of the low-hanging fruit items. If you are meeting compliance requirements, you can kind of downscope, put some stuff in a little bubble, and zero trust protect that. Um, and then, of course, cloud access control, which we've been doing to different degrees for a long time. Um, and then workload uh, segmentation. So I'm going to explain how all, any of these things and the rest of the zero trust uh, solutions fall into three main buckets. And then I'm going to explain to you why the products don't cross over because of the mechanism that they're using for enforcement policies. So something interesting to note is in talking to organizations a lot of them are going to have three different or maybe two or three different products and solutions um, for these top three um, use cases here. And then I've talked to a couple of organizations, in fact I've, I met one um, this week during a roundtable, who actually their organization decided to commit and they are doing this, 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 and that third party access all with the same solution, which is unusual, but it, it can happen. So the, the three kind of pathways into the zero trust, regardless of whether you're doing a, a strategy or a project-based solutioning, um, low-hanging fruit is let's just carve out those things that we know are easy wins for us. It's a low lift, things like third-party or contractor access or privilege access management. We're not impacting the entire user population, so the cost is lower, the impact is lower. It's usually an easy decision, and if it's one that doesn't fit with your long-term strategy, 
you can back out of it without a huge loss. The next thing is when we're getting into refresh cycles. And so if you're starting to, to lift and ship things into the cloud and you're doing things like VPN replacements, so you're already purchasing and making decisions, it's easy to slide in your zero trust uh, strategies there. And then back to that sort of critical data and application protection, if you do have types of data assets that are in scope for compliance, it's really easy to carve those out. We've been doing it a long time with PCI, right, when we scope the PCI network. Um, now we have CMMC and DFARS and things like that. So great use cases for zero trust and easy wins there. So I promised I was going to share with you the three main buckets. And I think this is really, when you understand that you're walking through this floor here, everybody's product falls into one of these three things. So the user to resource is probably the most common use case, right? And it doesn't matter where the user is and it doesn't matter where the resource is for this bucket process, for this, for this bucket purpose. So there are going to be some products that are going to work better on-prem and some that are more cloud native. But a user to resource is there, there's a human and usually a traditional operating system like a laptop or a phone, and we're talking about accessing resources on-prem or in the cloud. Then we get to device to device. And so for context here, the ZTNA type products fall under the user to resource solution. Then we get into device to device. Now this is really your network-based micro-segmentation. I'm being very intentional about saying network-based micro-segmentation because we'll talk about workload segmentation next. Um, and so really, the products that operate in this device to device, so these are, let's just say headless devices. This could be anything. It could be an OT, an operational technology environment. It could be um, biomedical devices. It could be other IoT type devices uh, or other kind of assets that don't necessarily have a traditional operating system and don't necessarily have a user attached to them. Most of the traditional network access control products and the evolution of those fall into here. And therefore, most of the vendors that came out of the networking space and had those sort of NAC-like products have focused a lot of their attention in that product space. And then the third is service to service. Um, so this is workload micro-segmentation. So most often when people talk about micro-segmentation, they mean workload segmentation or data center micro-segmentation. So that's server to server, service to service, application to application, or serverless architectures and microservices. Uh, and so as you can kind of imagine here, the, the product landscape and how we implement these, these three buckets is very different. There's not a lot of crossover between them. Make sense so far? Okay. All right, now, here we get into, oops, sorry, we got some wraparound going on there. Okay, here we get into the lingo. I'm, I'm telling, I'm gonna tell you this so I can tell you the next story in a second. We have some common language here. Um, so don't, don't worry about everything going on here. What I wanna point out is, is really two things. Um, number one, if you have worked with um, any type of network access control or trusted computing group concepts or frameworks in the past, for the past 10 or 15 years, this is the same language. These are the same words, the same phrases, the same acronyms, the same everything. So if you've worked in that space, this is gonna be very familiar. The second thing is that we have several ways to control that access. Out of those three buckets, what this model is showing us is that user to resource. It's a, it's a visual representation of that, right? There's a user that's accessing a resource. Um, this model, with obviously different graphics on it, could also depict device to device, or we would have a different visualization for workload segmentation. So let, let's just kind of look at what's going on here. And these things that wrapped around accidentally, these are policy enforcement points, which is just what it sounds like. It is the point at which we are enforcing a policy and or initiating the connection or the, or the data path. And so what this, what this model is showing here is we're using agents. So let me demystify what most of the products out there are doing and then I'm gonna roll back a little bit to some of the network stuff. So I'm gonna use agent broadly for, for something that's on the endpoint which might be something that's dissolvable or a non-persistent agent. So not necessarily something you have to install but something that's living on the endpoint 
even if it's temporary, to initiate this. So a policy enforcement point, and you're going to see a matrix and a table in a minute that will give you a, a, few, uh, a few ways to mentally connect these things. So there's a policy enforcement point shown here where the user is, and then there's a policy enforcement point shown up here where the asset is. In this particular case in the cloud, we have infrastructure and platform as a service assets up there, and the policy enforcement point can live on that asset directly, so maybe on a server or within an application, um, but it can also work in what we call an enclave model, which feels a lot like VPN. So what that's gonna do is there'd be kind of like a policy enforcement point here that's living as like, think of it as a gateway, firewall-ish type of thing. And that policy enforcement point is then get granting access to a group of resources in that enclave model behind it. So again, we, we can have this kind of one-to-one -one ratio of things, but we can also have a one-to-many ratio depending on the architecture needs of the environment. Same thing happens when we get down here on prem. We're gonna have something that's an agent. And again, I'm using the, the term agent a little bit loosely here, so bear with me. We can have, just like we have servers and applications in the cloud, we could do this down here as well, which would then eliminate what we do traditionally with DMZs. So you can install things directly on those assets and then get very granular with the control whether somebody's accessing it co-located on-prem or somebody's accessing it remotely. The depiction here of the hardware, and I'm gonna kind of refer to these as zero, I'm air quoting, zero trust enabled firewalls or zero trust enabled networking devices, which might be switches or routers. So these are gonna be maybe the same type of hardware platforms we've been used to, but they're gonna be upfitted with some code that lets us do integrations, for example, with APIs so that they can execute the enforcement from the, whatever the policy engine is. Now, in the, in the grand like NIST framework mecha perfect world, there's this master brain mind behind a curtain policy engine and it's supposed to be the policy engine. The reality is, is that as we're working through these use cases, you're gonna have several policy engines. You're gonna have several points in the infrastructure that are still making access decisions, at least for the foreseeable future. Now, maybe one day we'll get to that like you know giant brain, um, but for now, just be prepared that you're gonna have multiple sources of truth, as it were, for these different implementations to some degree. So when we get down here to the hardware, now, so now we have this zero trust enabled hardware where that piece of hardware can take instructions from this policy engine and allow, or not only just allow or deny that traffic, but do things like tunnel terminations, possibly traffic inspection and sampling, um, and get more granular with that least privilege concept. So instead of just, okay, you're on a VLAN, or okay, here's an ACL, that level of control is much more granular than that at this point. So that's the model here. The really crappy thing about zero trust is, it, so in my world, zero trust is very real. Like we do this, we're doing these projects, uh, we're implementing these, these products. Um, I think the challenge for most people is everybody, every vendor, everywhere for everything has taken whatever they do and they just slapped a zero trust sticker on it. So now you've got, you literally have zero trust everything. I've talked to vendors, I, I really hate when they do this. Um, you know, being, being an engineer myself, it's very misleading to people. So I talked to one recently and you know, it was like zero trust this and zero trust that. And I said, but what are you doing to zero trust? Well, oh, well, we, you know, we could feed into this other thing. And I'm like, well, that's, that's not really helpful actually. So this is a little bit problematic because we already have a lot of confusion around what the different solutions do. And now we have the, the zero trust toasters um, my friend Mitch made this for me because we were on a CISO talk and I said something about Zero Trust Toaster, so now this is floating around. So from a product perspective, and I'm going to have a couple of, of graphics and a little bit of you know, a Venn diagram on this. Um, in Jen's head, I lump the products into not just the three buckets, but also whether that solution architecture is designed to be cloud routed and cloud native, or it's more on-prem. There's a little asterisk because there's exceptions to a lot of these things, but what you'll see over here are your SASEs, um, your ZTNA, your CASBs, your secure web gateways, some SD-WAN stuff that of course translates over to on-prem as well. Um, so this will make more sense when we get to the 
to the table, but let me explain cloud routed really quickly because this is one of the other points of confusion with a lot of products, is that cloud routed means that regardless of where the user and the resource are, the tunnel for their communication is gonna go through the cloud, through the internet, through the cloud, through a point of presence, out, out, egressing, and then ingressing back in somewhere, which is totally cool if the user is not co-located with the resource, right? Users at home, users remote, resources in the cloud, whatever. That falls apart a little bit when suddenly the user is co-located with the resource because now we're kind of hairpinning out and coming back in. It falls apart a lot when we have applications that are heavy and high bandwidth or latency sensitive and we're pushing stuff out and coming back in. That, that model doesn't work. And so that, that's one of the things I like to explain because that is a huge determining factor whether a product is gonna work for you because some of them in certain architectures only do cloud routing. You can't get a direct connection between this and this, the way that this graphic is depicting it. Do you have a question? Okay. And, and you guys, if you have questions, please like, let's make this interactive. I hate just standing up and talking for, for 30, 40 minutes straight. All right, so we've got cloud routed. We can also get direct. I'll show you a little chart in a second. So from the kind of Venn diagram, obviously there's other stuff that's not on here. But I just kind of want to pull out the normal things we're seeing every day, the stuff you guys are seeing when you're walking around the show floor here. Um, and so ZTNA, just to sort of clear this up about what, what that is, we, we always talk about zero trust is not a product, zero trust is not a product, zero trust is not a product. And then somebody said, well, there's zero trust network access, which isn't network access, and actually, th this is a this is a cloud access solution. And I like Sunil and in, in his workshop this morning said it really should be zero trust application access. That is a better name for this technology. So what the ZTNA solutions do is and and why they're different than some of the other stuff we've had is the ZTNA products all follow the Cloud Security Alliance software defined perimeter framework. And just to distill that down and give you a visual for that, what we're aiming for is sort of a, what I call a lights out model. So, or they call it a dark cloud. You're aiming to not have indicators of the presence of your assets publicly on the internet. So functionally, if you're, you know, if you're a network or a security person, functionally what we're talking about is, um, so normally if you have applications that are accessible remotely, there's all kinds of things that indicate to the world that that exists. There's public DNS entries, right? So that applications can talk to each other and users can access things like VPN. So you have all of these things that are telling the world you have these assets and these resources, and then what you're doing is you're putting a gate right before that and, and supposedly you know allowing access uh, or not based on things like you know credentials. What ZTNA and the Cloud Security Alliance SDP aims to do is to say no 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 don't don't even let them know they exist. Don't don't show the world you have these things open. Connect to a trusted resource that's in the cloud and then let that trusted resource connect to or let the users and devices connect to that trusted resource that's floating out here. And that that brain, that engine, is gonna make the decision about that user, that resource, and if they're allowed to get to the asset, then it's gonna broker that connection for them. So as a user, even as an authorized user, I don't know and I don't have direct access to an asset, to whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. I don't, I don't even have visibility if I'm a malicious person and I'm scanning, I'm not gonna see it. Um, so that, that, in a good way, obscurity is what ZTNA is, is aiming to do. And I kind of liken it to driving through the country like in a wooded area out in the middle of nowhere where the, the road's doing this. And our current model is you drive through at night and you see driveways and you see mailboxes and you might see some light from the, from the house peeking through the trees. And so you know there's a house back there. 
ZTNA aims to do is no driveways, no mailboxes, no lights on the house. You, you see nothing when you're driving by. Okay, so that's all those products. And then we have things like SASE, where it's a service set, and then there's this, the subsets of SASE, like SSE, and whatever acronym one of the analysts came up with yesterday, I, I don't remember. Um, so we have all of that stuff there, which overlaps ZTNA quite a bit. And in reality, it's possible the SASE bubble might be bigger than the ZTNA bubble right now. We have cloud brokers, we have the secure web gateway, we have endpoint detection and response, and then we have the SD-WAN stuff. So if we look at this, pretty much if, if I could draw, all of that relates to the user to resource use case model, that first use case model. All of these are designed to protect a user accessing a resource. The workload micro segmentation is its own suite of products specific to segmenting within data centers or between data centers. And then we have network segmentation where all of the network access control, the advanced authentication servers and services, um, and then the new kind of zero trust network based micro segmentation products all fall. And so we have all the stuff we were doing before and now we have a little bit of a new breed of some of the micro segmentation um, that does stuff a little bit differently than traditional Mac. And then SD-WAN kind of straddles because it has a user to resource aspect but it also has a device to device aspect. So here's Jen's private nasty little draft uh, chart. Um, but I've had a lot of success using this, so I've, I've started sharing it more. So in, in private consulting um, with organizations and or with their vendors, um, this has been really helpful. And so if we go back to that concept of the three big buckets, we can see why the products don't overlap very much when we start to look at this. So back to the acronyms we saw on the drawing, we have a policy enforcement point type very loosely, and, and I'm addressing um, mostly user to resource and, and device to device. Uh, a little bit of what's down here gets into um, some of the mechanisms of that workload micro segmentation, but I'm not gonna, that is not my area of expertise, I'm not even gonna pretend. Um, so from those other two models, what we have is software or appliance, and the appliance can be physical or virtual. So what this starts to look like as we go down the tables on the software enforcement point type, just like I showed you guys on that drawing, we can have an agent, Loose, loosely agent, could be dissolvable agent, on the resource, an agent on the requester, an agentless a dissolvable agent on the requester, or some combination of the things above. So you can start to see here that, depending on the product, if you're talking about a managed endpoint and a corporate managed asset, this looks great. If you're talking about BYOD and maybe contractors, you want to start looking at maybe something that's agentless on the requester side, on that user side. Yeah? Okay. And then we get into how is it enforcing it. Now there's other aspects to things like building tunnels and encryption. But in general, we're controlling that access or initiating that access and sustaining it um, through external routing, possibly DNS captures, um, and then we have other things on the host with firewalls and routing we can do between those agents. And then the control granularity, and there's ellipsis here because I'm always learning about new solutions and new products, slash the vendors are coming out with new mechanisms. So this is, a, this is kind of a living document. Um, so then we get into how granular can it be? And then kind of the, uh, the secret little thing over here that people forget about is the direction. Because when we get into especially ZTNA type products, not all of them can initiate in both directions, meaning maybe you can have the user initiate to that asset, but that resource, that server, can't initiate something back out anywhere. So that's great for some types of access, and it's horrible and won't work for others, right? Okay, so that's the world of the software enforcement. Then we get down into this appliance-based enforcement. And again, it can be physical or virtual, so we're back in that world of, and when I have something here, like a firewall, it could be a virtualized firewall, it could be a hardware firewall like you're used to, right? And we get into, so again, remember that anything you see in here that's hardware that's listed as a enforcement point, has to be my air quote zero trust enabled piece of hardware, not you know not the firewall you bought ten years ago. I know you love your net screens, 
and they're still floating out there. But you're going to have to upgrade. You've got older stuff. All right, so then we get into things like micro gateways. So when I said that now we have in that device to device, we have some vendors that have popped up with sort of novel ways um, to do things. So if, as an example, there are some vendors out there that are doing what I call a micro gateway, which means they, for lack of a better a better description, um, they kind of hijack, they become the source. So in a VLAN, you point them to this box. So you point a whole network to this box, and it's going to then be the default gateway for the endpoints on that network. It's going to serve DNS, and it's basically going to serve out slash, slash 32s. So that endpoint can only get to that zero trust micro gateway box, and then that box makes a decision around can you access something else. And so that's a, you know, a layer three enforcement mechanism here. But it's different than what we were doing with NAC products before. So my point in this really is just that we have some new stuff that we, with the same hardware and same like levels of enforcement with layer two, layer three, that work functionally different than what we were doing a few years ago. So we have all that stuff. Then we get more into those enforcement mechanisms, your normal stuff here, right? Because we don't have suddenly magical firewalls that can suddenly do, well, okay, sometimes we can do agent level control on a firewall. That's a bad example. But probably not on a lot of the switches and routers we have. So we get into these pretty granular mechanisms, and some of them are pretty robust. We can do things like VN, uh, VXLAN and other network virtualization functions. It kind of overlays um, things like SDN and SD-WAN. And then our normal stuff we've been doing at layer two and layer three, VLANs, ACLs, all of that jazz. And then same thing there, we get into that control granularity. Um, the other piece that we're sort of layering on is that access decision from this policy engine that's sitting somewhere is we're, we're trying to, again, that kind of perfect world picture of zero trust is we're trying to get better context of what's going on. And what we've been doing for a while already is a device posture, things like that, right? So whether it's VPN or network access control, one of the things we've been doing is what is the posture of the endpoint? You know, does it have antivirus installed? Things like that. We've been doing that, but now we're kind of talking about let's get more mature with that. Let's take that to the next level and let's look at the posture of other things. So maybe the posture, the security posture, or the risk posture of the network, and it could be the network where the user is, it could be the network where the asset is, or it could be the internet in general. So these are where some of the threat intel fees are coming into these. We might talk about the posture of the user. Is it, it, was that user's account compromised? Has it shown up on the dark web? And then we can start to overlay some of this other stuff. So some of these are gonna be pretty generic, blah, blah, we've already been doing it. And some of this, though, we're really ratcheting it up a notch from what we've been doing. And then we, of course, get into things like least privilege control, and that access is more granular. And then, of course, the data path mode we talked about earlier with the drawing of cloud routed, not cloud routed. So the questions you start to ask are, OK, what is my use case out of the three buckets? User to resource, device to device, or workload micro segmentation. That's where you start. Then you get into where are my, if it's users, if, where are my users, where are my assets and resources? Is cloud routed okay, is it not okay? And then how am I gonna do this with an enforcement model? Is software gonna work? Can I install agents, can I not? What's the level of granularity? In which ways can we initiate? And then for the on-prem stuff, you've got all of this down here. So I, I promised I would share a little bit of the content I do for how to actually get started. Um, and sorry, these are kind of silly examples, but I wanted to just pull something that you know anybody, whether they worked in identity or network or security, um, could kind of wrap their heads around. So these are the examples that I pulled here. So this is just an evaluation of okay, we're 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 taking what we're doing now and we're starting to map it against the zero trust principles. So we've got things like, here's Joe, or maybe this is a group of users. Um, it's a SaaS application model, because we're going to a CRM that's hosted somewhere else. Maybe that's Salesforce. Um, yes, it's encrypted. No, we're not inspecting or brokering it. Not really applicable for ZTNA, because this is a public service. And then we get into least privileged multi-factor. And are we factoring in any type of posturing to this decision? 
Now, obviously, there's more principles of zero trust, uh, so this table could keep going. We could have a lot more columns here, but these are these are the the handful that most organizations are starting with when they're evaluating their their policies for user to resource or device to device. So then we get into some of the privileged access management stuff. So we see here an internal IT operations team. Um, so people that have Kings of the Kingdom internally, uh, both on-prem and in the cloud environment. And then we're talking through, yes, it's inspected, um, still not doing any of these things in terms of brokering or ZTNA. Um, of course, we're doing multi-factor. And yes, we have some endpoint posturing through the VPN system. Um, and then we have here uh, third-party vendors. And, and this example is you know, Siemens uh, in a healthcare environment. This could as easily be anything. It could be an office that has managed printers and a third party is managing the printers or any application in the environment or any endpoints in the environment. So now we're looking at, okay, so that's an on-prem model. In this particular example, these things are, are living on campus, right? Yes, it's encrypted. No, we're not doing those things. We're not really following least privilege because we're dropping them on a network that has access to this, but that network has access to other things as well. So, so that's the model of what we have. So this is kind of like, I know it's very vanilla 101, but it's just a starting point to wrap your head around. So then you start to figure out what are the red flags here? Where's your low-hanging fruit? Yellow flags, orange flags, maybe there's some, there's some stuff that jumps out at you. Now, what matters here is very organization dependent. So when I'm doing consulting calls with my clients or I'm doing consulting calls through IONS, the, like the one thing we get asked all the time is, what is everybody else doing? What is everybody else doing? What is everybody else doing? What are my peer organizations doing? And we all hate that because what works for one organization and what's appropriate for one doesn't necessarily translate to the other. Even if it's the same industry, even if it's the same size organization, the network architectures, the tools, and frankly, the people resources they have vary so greatly. So even all things being equal, if we walk into a shop and you've got like a hotshot cloud person or a hotshot this, you're going to be able to do things in your organization that another organization that doesn't have that talent can't safely do themselves. They're going to need to outsource it. So we kind of look at this and then we get into making some decisions about what the risk impact um, of that is. And I'm not going to get into that here, but we start to assign values and it is we're taking something that's that's qualitative and we're making it be quantitative so maybe maybe we get maybe when we fix this that's 10 points of value and maybe when we fix that it's it's five and maybe when we fix that it's three and so we can start to kind of have these these models of measurements of instead of just percent completion Jen hates percent completion for risk, for risk and security metrics. I don't care that you rolled out 80 the AV to 80% of the endpoints. I don't care that you rolled out multi-factor to 72%. Which 72% based on from a risk pro profile perspective, right? So I like risk-based metrics um, and impact-based metrics. So then you get into the actual solution mapping of, you know, these are the scenarios you saw from, from earlier. Um, this is our access, our network model, and then what are some of the different solution suites that could serve you here? And then this is fun because obviously this is a truncated version of this exercise, but what you start to get into as you list through which of the alphabet soup can solve these problems and you prioritize these problems, that's where you start to figure out where the product overlap can happen because you can get product overlap. It's just you shouldn't look for the one silver bullet to solve all of your zero trust problems. So now you can start to say, oh, okay, well, we, like I showed you guys on that one screen with the six blocks and I said, usually organizations have three different solutions here and I just talked to somebody yesterday that, or yes, yesterday that did four of those blocks with one product and one deployment. And yes, it was painful, but they did it. So here's where we get into that mapping. Uh, and the nice part is, is instead of just sending off different teams to do different things, um, and each person or each group coming back with some product uh, and implementing it in a little bit of a silo and then realizing stuff doesn't work together and you're managing a bunch of tools, um, that's another challenge most organizations hit at some point. This is nice because you're, you can at least take your top priority projects and see if you can kill a few birds with one stone there. 
So, the, the one thing that has Juniper on it, so that you guys can kind of wrap your head around the context of what you can see here in the booth. Um, from the SASE and SSE, uh, Juniper just announced this, this week some of their additional solutions in that space. Um, the entire Juniper Secure Edge uh, in the Casby world, SSR up here, uh, and then they do have cloud workloads. So one of the things I told you guys is you're not going to find one product that does all three buckets. What you will find, though, is there are some manufacturers, some vendors that do have different products that solve each of those buckets. And in some cases, if we get back to that user to resource and device to device use cases, you're, you're going to have a few products that overlap those two things a little bit. But what I'll tell you is that from having worked in that space for a while, where we are right now, it may change, but where we are right now, the, the, the solutions that do user to resource very well do not do device to device very well and vice versa. So it kind of depends on which one is your cheeseburger and which one is the fries on the side with that. Um, so as, as we mature, as the technology matures, we're going to get to the point where those things converge a little bit. But don't be shy and don't look for one, one specific product to solve them all. All right. I've been talking a lot. Um, that's all I have for you guys in terms of slides. Um, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.